Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to cover verse 12 through 19 this morning. As you go through, I'm going to read a passage from Matthew 19 that really is one of the saddest passages in Scripture for me to read. I have some hopes and some dreams, and I have some questions when the Lord returns for us, in particular to this passage that gives me some hope. Passage makes me very sad. I'll read it to you to frame what we're going to look at in First Peter this morning. But this comes from Matthew chapter 19, and we start in verse 13. It says, "The children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven.'" And he laid his hands on them and went away. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? He asked him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you want eternal life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbors yourself. This is what he said to the young man and said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go and say that you possess the gift of the poor, you have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrow, for he had great possessions. It's a very, very sad passage for me. Now, let me just say this. I almost said this to let my heart off the hip to be able to get through to talk about it, but my dream, my hope, my desire, is that this was not the last encounter that this young man had with Jesus. In my mind, I've created a narrative where Jesus and, and this man's path crossed again, and Jesus gave him another test, and he passed that test. Everybody talks about, oh, man, I want to see Paul, I want to see Peter, I want to see John. Honestly, in my heart, I want to see this man. And that probably there's a tenderness in me, probably because I've always been one of those students who failed plenty of tests. Now, you can see how Matthew frames this teaching for us, as this teaching frames for us what Peter would have to share with us this morning. Matthew frames this in the context of the children coming to Jesus. They've heard of Jesus, they've seen Jesus, and Jesus is here, and they want to go to Jesus. The religious disciples, they would say, no, 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 that's not protocol. And Jesus said, scrap protocol, get these kids to me. This is the answer to the kingdom. This is how you enter the kingdom. Let them come to me. And then he tells a story about an adult who comes to him. Now, this adult came to him in some good context. Notice, if you look at my reading, that he approached him as a teacher. I think that helps us frame this understanding. I thought back through this as I prepared for this message on my many years in school and the teachers that I remember and some that I, I can't remember. And I look back on the ones that I remember. I look back on the ones that are still influencing me today. And I want to share a couple of those with you and then try to understand why that they have that influence even to today. I think that Mrs. Barnes, my third grade teacher. Now, the only teacher I ever had was my fourth grade teacher. I would have quit school in the fifth grade. But prior to fourth grade, I had Miss Barnes for third grade. And I loved Miss Barnes. I remember as a high school going back in to Miss Barnes School. And this was in a large area with a large grade school and large high school. I remember going back and walking in. It felt like I had to duck when I walked in the doorway in that room that used to be so big of Mrs. Barnes' classroom. And when I walked in, she recognized me. She called me back in and showed me the plant that I got her when I was in third grade. Now, that's cool. I think of Miss Whaley, who was my English professor <laughs> at college. I had made my, my mark in business and then got called into the ministry Resigned that I went back to school to finish my bachelor's degree, and my first class was an English class from Miss Whaley. And I, I remember when I went to school, I was hired on as a janitor, and I'm, I'm in my janitor's uniform, and I'm walking into this English class, and I'm so beyond all this stuff, little mind. And I see Miss Whaley, and she goes, Oh, you're in this class. Or, Oh, are you here to cut the trash can? And I said, Yep. Yeah. I said, I had to. 
she kind of took it over there and said, well, of course you need to say English. I said, no, this is not English. We got computers. I don't need English skills anymore. And she goes, oh, I didn't know my husband was a banker and he, he, he uses English more than I do. And I said, well, I run my own store and I have my secretary do all my writing. And she did the job. She looked at me and, I, and that was my attitude. I, I was a punk. The first time we got our assignments back, writing a sign and what she taught me was, I love the writing. I didn't realize how much I loved English. And uh, so we got to She hands mine out at the very end. She handed everybody's out. And when she hands it, I noticed immediately it had an A on it. But when she handed it, she kind of held it for a second and looked at me until I got an eye contact. And she was, she was inspecting every, every square inch of my brain with her piercing in my eyes, waiting to find out who it was that wrote this paper. Because it certainly couldn't be this punk know it all janitor. And so she did this. She handed all the papers out and she walked back to the classroom and she goes, All right, class, let's have a pop quiz on writing. Everybody, clean your desk and here's your writing assignment. Let the set go. I'm like, Oh, man. And so I get to writing and I kind of got into it and I told this story. And about five, ten minutes goes by and she goes, All right, you can you put your pencil down. And she goes, Let's just randomly hear from a few students. Why don't you read your books? And I did. And it, it was horrible. And I had to prove to her that Rebecca hadn't written my paper. But she taught me to love school. She taught me to love English. I think that I've shared some of these stories. Of course, you you know Dr. Utley, who continues to be a mentor in my life. And I remember going to him. Oh, I was so on fire. I was so excited. I was learning as much as I possibly could. And, and, I, and I knew much more than I had learned. I mean, that's just kind of how I was. And, and I went to him and said, I've got an idea for a book. This is what I'm going to write on. What do you think? He goes, I don't even think that's biblical. And I just, all the way, just, I'm like, how could you do that to me? Where's the encouragement? But he put me through these tests. Miss Wayne, you didn't sweep Miss Barnes, but Dr. Utley put me through these tests. I remember my mother and all, all, all those listening who, who take piano lessons and voice lessons over the last 30 years from my mother. You're welcome. She changed her teaching because of me. So my mother taught piano and we had to take piano from her. And so I had a decent ear and a pretty quick mind at that time. And so what I would do with my mom was I would say, hey, would you play this once for me so I know what it's supposed to sound like? Oh, she just get up there. <laughs> and I'd hear it and I had it. And then I would lie and tell her I found it. I could pass the test. But guess what I did not play? I didn't learn how to play the piano. I would love to go over to this piano and just say, hey guys, gather around. Let's worship together. Oh, the joy that that would bring my heart. And I can't because I could the system, pass the test, and really have failed the test. I think that uh, back to back, when I got to the you know, university that I did my doctoral work at, I met him for the first time in front of everyone. He pointed at me and he said, you will never make it through this program. He only had to hit two words up to know that I would take what it took. Later, he would cut me out again and we had some frustrations. But you know, I wanted to quit on my doctor so many times. Sometimes in tears, I'd be over here in the study and I was like, well, I'm not doing this. I'm going to give up. I'm going to quit. And then guess who was standing right in front of me in my mind? Dr. Badley, who pointed at me and said, you'll never make it through this program. And so I turned it back and said, I'll show you. And I made it through the program. Each of these teachers that I mentioned are so different in all their cultures and all their aspects. But I remember all of them, and all of them influenced me today. And here's my introduction. Here's what I look back and say, what is it about these two? And it's really one of two things, and most of the time it's both of these together. But the first is, there was a sense from that teacher that they would never give up on me. That my next fair test would never be my last. That no matter how much of a punk or how much I thought I knew, or how many times I didn't study enough, that they would never give up on me. To walk in after all those years and, and have Miss Barnes go, Tim, you don't see the point you're getting from? Something deep within her heart that said, I'm not going to give up on this kid. But also, 
they were teaching for testing me about it. And I remember in junior high and high school, and I went to a big junior high and a big high school, and there was, if you were going to take English, you could, you would have to choose between two or three, maybe sometimes four different teachers for which course of English you would take. I remember that that week would come, and we had to decide what we were taking the next semester. All the kids together, and we would try to grab some older students if we could find them, and say, which we pick? And you know what the main criteria was? Who gets the hardest test, and who gets the easiest test? I guess which ones we always try to pick. The easiest test. I recognize that about myself and see that that has also translated into faith in my journey with the Lord, and it's something that cannot continue. You see, this picture of the ruler, he had done what religion had said to do. He felt like he had prepared. He, he felt like he had studied everything that he was supposed to study, and he showed it to the teacher and said, give me the test, and he failed the test. And he went away sad. In my dreams and in my deepest desires, I believe that he had a maybe even a dream. I dream of the day that I'll get to embrace him in heaven and have him teach me a few things about that. But these teachers that we remember, at least the ones I do, from something innate within them that they would not give up on me. And then they proved me by giving me hard tests, some of which I failed. And eventually, that was what I passed. I think the sixth lesson framework of where we find Peter's in chapter 4, verse 12 through 19, as I have said, it is not fair to approach Peter in this way by breaking it up. And it's certainly not fair to just show up of that teaching before, and so I put that on you. you. Go back on the website, go back on the YouTube channel, catch up, follow up, because so much of this teaching, which can be very difficult, which is life teaching, is not going to be ours for the taking if we haven't walked with Peter through this. But just to summarize in the simplest terms, what brings us to chapter 4, verse 12, and the following verses is really what Peter has said the end of all things is at hand. If I were to summarize everything that Peter brings to a focal point to lead us into chapter 4, verse 12, it is that the end of all things is at hand. That's the framework. And we've talked about that over the weeks, that we, we're in the end times. We've been in the end times since Jesus ascended to the heavens to prepare a place for us. And we are waiting Him to return. And I don't know if it'll be today or when today is tomorrow or when today is the next day, but Jesus is going to return. And we are in the last times. And Peter's speaking to part of the church, a people group who were scattered, who were cut off from the rest of the church, who were going through persecution for who they were and what they believed. He said to them, Look around, you can see the signs. Obviously, in the end times, and he said, in light of that, we are to live as good stewards of God's grace. It occurs to me as we learn from Peter, we sometimes ask the wrong questions. For generations, we've asked the question, are you saved or are you not saved? I like this question better. Are you a good steward of God's grace? To be saved, don't you? You need to die to yourself and receive salvation from God through Jesus Christ. But sometimes we treat that like binary, like on or off. Are you saved or are you not saved? I think the better question is, are you being a good steward of the grace that has been entrusted to you? Not just have you been reconciled to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, but are you being a good minister of that same reconciliation? People say, in times of end, this is it. Take a measurement, understand where you are, all you being a good steward of God's grace. And that leads us into chapter 4, verse 12 through 19. So let me read this to you, and then we'll pick it apart a little bit. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you see what Christ suffered. That you may also be able to be glad when these glories will be. If you are consulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief 
or an evildoer, or he has a measure. He appeals to someone as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's dive into this. In regards to how far we get verse by verse, we will get to the punchline. It's actually, there's so much here we could spend hours, we won't, but we could. But it's actually very simple in its final understanding, and so rest at ease, we will get there. And let's start in verse 12. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the final trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Here we are again with this idea of a test. Peter's trying to frame for us the reality. As Christians, as those who have given their life, died to themselves, and trusted Christ for new life, the mindset, the, the story, and the idea that, oh man, now look what's happening now. Oh man, why is this happening to me? Oh, when's enough going to be enough? It's the wrong framework. Peter's trying to help us understand, no. Don't be surprised when these fiery trials come upon you to test you as though something were happening to you. Part of the story of Christianity is that you will be tested. We need to embrace it. I struggle with that sometimes. I, I'm so frustrated that when those tests come, they still surprise me. I'm tired of them surprising me. It's like God says there's going to be a test Friday. Tuesday goes around and says, Don't forget to study for the test Friday. And he goes, don't forget, we got a test coming up Friday, Thursday. And Friday, I show up and there's a test, and it's like, what? I ain't got time to prepare. What's going on? Who's against me? Why is all this happening? God, if you love me, you wouldn't let this happen. Peter, who's taking us to this radical understanding of what it means to follow Christ, is now saying that understanding needs to change the framework, the perspective of your life. You will be tested. Jesus was. Jesus baptized. No more. When in the wilderness and was tested. Jesus, before the cross, went, went into Gethsemane and was tested. And if you read his interactions with his disciples, he was tested every single day between those two events as well. Jesus embraced, Peter embraced that the life of a Christian is a life of tests. The circumstances that God takes us by the hand and allows us or leads us through are not just our way we live in a fallen world, but for a Christian, it's so much more. These are tests. These are opportunities to see how we measure up. It's an opportunity to quit. The way that you said, I can't do it. It's also an opportunity to stand up and say, no. No, 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 no. I will not quit. I will face this test head on. But I want you to see, if you don't see anything else today, I want you to see this, how Peter frames this for us. This conversation that he's having with us, he begins with one word. Beloved. Beloved. And maybe you're from the South, too, and maybe you just grown up with people talking like that. I remember in, when I was in Tennessee one time, and I went to a picnic with Kay Arthur. And I pulled the stage for about a thousand other people there, too. But Kay was at the We met at the little Chick fil A table, and uh, I introduced myself to her and told her I really appreciated her teaching. And she came around to kiss me right here on the cheek and cut the book. I didn't watch that cheek and stuff started breaking out. Oh, I'm telling you what. There's something ooey and gooey and wonderful when K. Arthur Chuck calls you beloved. This word that Peter is using is no small word. This is the word that God used to speak of Jesus and his baptism. You'll find it in Matthew 3. It says, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. God called Jesus his beloved. Jesus called his disciples his beloved. 
And his disciples called their disciples his people. And Peter even calls us the others. Guys, this is deep. This is different than just that notion. He was a lot of that. But Peter says, You're not just going to be a little This is different, right? Love, yeah, I say some burritos. But Rebecca is my beloved. You can understand that difference, right? Peter frames this context of fiery trials, tests, that we will fail some of them. Someone will just knock us down. Someone will pick ourselves up. Someone will have to cling on to others and say, help me, help me. We can't get through this alone. Fiery trials that test the genuineness of our faith. And Peter says, at the end of this, you need to trust, understand, embrace. You are God's beloved. The reality is, though, some of you might not be. You see, that rich young ruler, he came to Jesus to negotiate terms for his offer. He hadn't died to himself, he hadn't surrendered. Negotiations with God for what it looks like after he dies. He had listened to the religious education. He had done what they said. He had jumped through the hoops. He had kept the laws. He went to Jesus, the teacher, and said, Pass this test. And Jesus says, I don't know. Can you sell everything and come follow me? And he went away sad and failed that test. Why? Because he had died to himself. If he had died to himself, he would have known I possess nothing. Regardless of how many riches he had been entrusted with, he wouldn't understand. I'm just a steward. You want me to come follow you? I need to lay down what you all need to own? Okay, sure, yeah. And he would have followed him. But that test proved that he had died to himself. He had kept himself and as himself was negotiating terms for the afterlife. Folks, that's not salvation. And that's not Christianity. But if you have laid down your life and died to self, and sometimes that gets caught up in the nebulous because it's such a it's such a lofty concept. But I have the picture in Scripture of taking off the old and putting on the new. It's like you recognize on a daily basis, though certainly we do that once and for all. In addition to that, daily as we live out the salvation, we recognize that that is in us and of us, that self. We call that sin. Sometimes we follow the, the expressions of that sin. It's kind of like a... a the trail of bread comes that takes us to the heart of sin. But as we confess those sins, Lord, I did this and you revealed that that's wrong. I didn't do this and you revealed that that's what you desire. As we begin to confess that and follow those bread comes back to the heart of sin, we realize we're hanging on to self. We're carrying around this dead corpse. And so we take that off and take an old garment. The girl just been out in the field and just, oh, just sweaty and nasty. And that garment will pretty much stand up on its own and it introduces you long before you come to the room. And, and you, you probably get to a place where you can take that off, just very carefully put it in the incinerator, or, or hand it to somebody and say, go hang this outside or something, hose it down. And you take that off, and then you put on, oh, you get to put on that new. You have to die to yourself to receive this life from Jesus Christ. And once you've done that, God says, you are my beloved. My beloved? I don't have to give up on you. Your next test will never be your last test. Your next failing will never be your last test. I will never give up on you. You are my beloved. He goes on to verse 4, 4 13 and says this. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. Two things here. Rejoice. This word is an active imperative. And what that means is that it's to be carried out moment by moment, perpetually, and the responsibility is on us. So in this sense, rejoice doesn't mean that we rejoice when the circumstances are good, we rejoice when things are going our way, we rejoice when we feel like it. This is an active imperative. This is a command that we perpetually rejoice as we share in Christ's suffering. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 5. He said, Yes, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake 
For this is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and other people of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. There is no way to embrace this as a framework for life. There's no way to embrace this as the actions of our faith to the Jewish and those testimonies unless we recognize that we have died to sin, that we are made alive in Christ, that we are God's beloved, and that He is taking our hand and walking us through this test to test the genuineness of our faith and to increase the influence of our witness. There's no way you can embrace that radical viewpoint if you have not died to self. You can't do it. And this exposes in me all the time. Something will come on at all seems to blindside me. And my first thought is, well, God, I'm so tired of this. Not again. Why me? Why aren't you nicer to me? Why would we do to me? All these false narratives start banging around in my head. You spit that out. You take it off like an old nasty garment. You recognize that you've laid down your life and that you are in Christ. And you put on that new. And you rejoice that you get to share. I love this. There's a account where they went to prison. They were released. They were brought to release just for good measure. They were beaten. And when they walked out, the whole church rejoiced that they were worthy to be counted alongside Jesus. That's, that's what you're probably that's not something our society or our culture teaches. On the contrary, our culture says, oh no, be true to yourself. Take care of self. Make sure and esteem self. Peter says, well, you try that, but it ain't going to work. Let it be right. And you'll be able to pick up this framework that says, I can rejoice in these suffering stuff. The reality is, let's get real practical here. Very few of us have the ability to do that alone. That's why we have that church. That's why we have that each other. You know, there's there's a lot of folks that in our midst who would call themselves part of our church. And that this pandemic and all the turmoil that's going on has been a test for them that to this point they've failed. They've used it as an excuse to get about self, to distance themselves from the church, to get angry and hateful. So, oh, you didn't get the word. That was just a pop quiz. That wasn't even the midterm. That wasn't even the final. No, come back to school. Good ball. Let's go get tested again, and we'll do it together this time. We have to do this together. But Peter says, you can rejoice as you share in Christ's suffering because we know what this test is about. But also like this in, in verse 13, he says, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. I love this in John 14, it says, let your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, please no one from the 80s sing that song, please. That might have been the 90s. Don't sing that song. Now I'm singing it. Oh, okay, so in my Father's house are many rooms. If it was so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And thank you for Thomas. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, you also need to understand, as Christians, we embrace the circumstances we get through, the struggles, whether they're personal and perhaps small, or whether they're corporate and even global, we embrace those struggles as a test, knowing that this tests the genuineness of our faith. And so we are able to embrace it with rejoicing. Not alone, not cut off, but together we can say, hey, remember, I, I, I call my discipleship partners up and I'm like, wah, 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 wah. And they say, you told me last time I went, but wah, 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 wah. And I'm like, no, not really, but go ahead. We build each other up, we put our arms around each other, we encourage each other, and we fix this test with rejoicing, but we also need to know this. There is an end to all this. There is a conclusion to all this. This isn't just what This is our lot in life. Jesus is prepared to place for us and He promises to return for us. Think about that for a second. 
when he comes back for us, and I love how he puts this, he says, rejoice in your sufferings so that we may also rejoice when his glory is revealed. Man, we'll cover this a little bit later too in this passage, but brother and sister, fellow Christians, if we can't rejoice in walking through the tests that God brings us through, how are we going to know how to party when he gets here? Do we really think that we're going to have it down when he gets here if we haven't rejoiced with him through this? These struggles, these hard times, these broken and failing bodies, these broken and failing relationships, these broken and failing cultures. There's an expiration date. Jesus is preparing a place. He's going to come back. He's going to make all things new. You are party then. He says, let that part Rejoice even as God takes us through these sufferings. He goes on verse 14. If you look at the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of the glory of God rests upon you. Oh, I love this. We all talked about how this beloved frames for us that picture of Jesus being baptized. What happened at that baptism? Jesus went down, modeled for us the truth of the heart, that he was not living for himself. It's hard for us to embrace and understand that, but Jesus modeled, Jesus gave examples through the physical baptism of dying to self and being raised again to this life that was for the Father and for His will and for His purpose. Jesus came out of that baptism, and it says not only did the Father say, This is my beloved, but it also said, What? The Spirit descended upon Him. What is, what is Peter telling us here? He says, you are so in the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of the glory of God rests upon you. He takes you back to that picture to recognize that if you've died to yourself, and if you're raised anew in Christ, that the same helper that helped Jesus walk this life of faithfulness, He is now sent to us to help us. If you don't die to yourself, and you're just negotiating for your afterlife, you don't get the Holy Spirit. You've got to do this on your own. I can barely do it with the Holy Spirit. I don't want to even think about what I'd have to do without Him. But Peter encourages us, you're going through these trials. You've committed to rejoice, knowing that they're tests, knowing that in God you can pass them. And Jesus says, but I'm going to send you a helper. Jesus says, you're going to have tests. You're going to have trials. You need to be curious to this, knowing that they're, they're testing the genuineness of your faith. And they're expanding the excellence of your witness. But know that you're not doing this alone. We have the church. Peter's writing to the church. We also have the Holy Spirit. But only if you've died to yourself and been raised to newness of life in Christ. We go on to verse 15. And I really love this passage. How <laughs> do you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evil doer? As a man. Oh man, I gotta memorize this passage. Um, that word meddler literally means to inspect what belongs to another. Think about that for a second. To inspect what belongs to another. No, this is a busy body. Be a murderer. Don't be a thief. Just in case you miss said, don't be an evildoer. And then at the top of that, but the crescendo of that, he says, don't be a busybody. But there's, some, there's a lesson in that. The Bible says that we are to care for the belongings of others, that we are to care for the soul and the heart of another. The Bible, in essence, says we are supposed to be up in other people's business. It says somewhere in the that we are to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then it says, and we are to love our neighbor as our soul. Here's the difference. If you are a religious person who has not died to self and, you are, and are just negotiating with God about what happens after you die, when you get into the business of your neighbor, you are a meddler. You're a busybody. It's you trespassing into what belongs to them. But you die to yourself and you're living a new life in Christ, then you are about your Father's business. And the care for your neighbor is the care for the soul that was created in the image of God. And that's not everything. 
Peter tells us here, if you're going to suffer for being a Christian, we need to rejoice in that. Count it worth to be alongside of Jesus. But if you're suffering for just being yourself, whether you're a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or evil, and you suffer for that, that's on you. That's not Jesus. The difference is, are you living for yourself? Just think about the implication that if you're living for yourself, if you've not died for yourself, you're just negotiating with God to reach means to secure yourself at the ending, at the end of this uh, life. Then everything you try to do, even at the heart of the gospel, to love God with all of you all, let your neighbors yourself, you don't have to. You're lumping there in the same bag with evil dudes, thieves, and murderers. But if you die to yourself and you live this life of faith out, when you invest in your neighbor's life, you're doing that as a kingdom, as, as a representative of the kingdom of God. It makes all the difference. It does bring up a big question, and we've kind of covered most of this, but why do Christians suffer? There are those who would teach that if you have enough faith, you won't suffer. It's hard to swallow because I see Jesus' life and what he went through. But it's a good question to say why, and I'm not, we're not going to go into this, we're going to dive into this, but I want to get to it. Here's, here's four thoughts on why Christians suffer. First one is because of personal sin. You know, God created a real world. And when you wake make a real mess, you'll have real consequences for that. And you'll have real suffering. It, it is what it is. Sometimes we make a mess and then blame God for not getting us out of it. You know, sometimes He does. Sometimes we feel like we get away with it for a little bit. And it kind of adds to the, to the, to the law. But sometimes you just suffer because you messed up. You confess it. We've seen that here in our church. We've seen models of that. Just confess it. Bring it out of the light. Say, I messed up. I made no excuses. I don't believe it. It's wrong. I confess it. I get to do it. Take off that old garment. It stinks. We spend it when we walk in anyway. Just take it off. Put on that newness of life. Sometimes we suffer, and we talk about this, to develop Christ likeness. Crazy concept to think that Jesus suffered to. To develop Christ's likeness, but, it, but the scripture backs me up. It says he goes to the Jesus from, from the way he suffered. Jesus gave his life to the Father. He said, I'm not here for my own, I'm here for him. And he went through these trials, and the Jesus we see at Gethsemane is mature and grown and developed from the Jesus we see come out of those waters of baptism. That, that'll blow your mind if you think on that too long. But the reality is, sometimes we need to go through these trials just to develop our own Christ likeness. The other thing we mentioned this too is to develop an effective witness. You know, I can preach from this pulpit. I can go out with a bullhorn in the streets. I can preach these truths. But here's the reality: when your family member, when your neighbor, when your coworker sees you go through a trial and see you suffer fail regardless, but they see you lean into God and they see your faith strengthen. And they see that you come out of this closer to this God that you proclaim. That witness is undeniable. They can reject my teaching all day long. Ask the preacher. Of course he's going to say that. But when you actually live out your faith by going through these trials while rejoicing, knowing that you're testing the genuineness of your faith, and your neighbor, your co-worker, your friend, your family, member, your friend is looking on, and they see that it's undeniable. They won't be able to get away from it. We got to Jesus to increase our witness. And here's something, too. The sufferings of Christians are part of the signs of the birth pains of the new age when Jesus is going to return. What is the last days? Jesus is going to be back for us. And some of these sufferings and trials that the church goes through are just like birth pains, the scripture says. I've seen that. I've, I've never given birth. I just want to make sure you guys knew that. I've never given birth, but I have been, I've been close enough, and, and I've been the heaviest one on that well-used, clean-sized bed uh, at the midwife's office there. And so, everything cooled at my knees. So, I've been in it. But there's just something amazing about seeing a, a beloved person go through the most excruciating pain. You just want to reach in and grab everything you can, and you can't, you have to go through it. And to see that thing 
to watch it go through that, and then instantly, I've never seen anything so fast in my life, instantly, when the birth takes place, it's all gone. It's nothing but joy. That baby's just messy, flopping up there on the desk, and you're like, oh, this is wonderful, I love it. I'm like, it's too much. I mean, I'm, now I'm messy, and I, I'm, I'm emotionally shocked. I mean, it was like horrible, horrible, wonderful, wonderful. But this is a picture. Jesus is coming back. The God describes it. There's both things to that. that we're, we're, we're going through this time where it struggles, and it's going to get hard. It's not going to get easier. I don't even think this pandemic is a big test. I ain't a pop quiz. But whatever comes today, whatever comes tomorrow, it's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse. We're going to have harder trials. We're going to have harder tests. It's just like that birth pains. But man, it compares nothing to the joy of that life. The end of those pains. This is how the Bible describes Jesus coming back. Man, we can't just coast through this. And I know all of us want an epidural. I get it. Who's sucking me up? But we talk about that in faith, don't we? Oh, God, can't you just give me an epidural? Knock me out and wake me up when the baby's here. There's no, man, I'm saying, that's why I don't ever carry no baby. I'd be like, oh, I'm pregnant? Okay, put me in a coma. Wake me up in 10 months. Man. But we can't do that in faith. We've got to walk through this together. Suffering because of all of these different things, but Peter says, frame this correctly. It's a time for rejoicing. He says in verse 16, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that day. We can't make sense because we don't understand that the word Christian was only used three times in the New Testament. This wasn't what it's become. It wasn't a, a place of honor. Hey, I'm a Christian. This was derogatory. It was actually the first time it was used is the, the one church, the church of Antioch, that was just as good at dispersing as they were. Yeah. We experienced that as a church. As soon as we started dispersing instead of just gathering, instead of just the, in, when it changed from just being, y'all come to here we come, you're going to get attacked. You're going to have people bring up false accusations. You're going to have people in the community say some of the weirdest things. Peace. Anyone suffers as a Christian, and that's a, it's a bad word. You know, so if you suffer, somebody if somebody cusses at you and calls you a Christian, because that's what that word was. He says, but Man, that's awesome. It totally changes the framework of a mindset. And then in 17 and 18, it says, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the last excuse is say, what will become the ungodly and the sinner? It's quoting Proverbs 11. Once again, Peter brings us to a sobering thought. As Christians, we have to have the soberness of mind. We have to come back to these realities. If what he's described is someone who has died to themselves and given their life to Jesus Christ, take up new life in Him, who are living not only for God in Jesus, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, if this life that he's described is that we are going to go through fiery trials, pains, struggles, that can only be compared to the pains of birth itself, how much worse for those who've not even called on God And that's got to sober you right up. That's got to make you your your heart sink and your your eyes lift and go, man. We got to be serious about this. Malachi kind of doubles down on that when he when he says, "Are you really you you want the Lord to return? Are you ready for that? Don't you know when He returns, He's going to test you. He's going to judge you first, the church. But the reality here is, and what needs to bring our hearts to a place of focus is." If those who have entered into eternal life now and are waiting for the consummation of that when Jesus returns for us are having to go through these struggles, how much worse will this be for those who have not called on Him? I cannot imagine an eternity apart from God, under the judgment of God, because our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, some of you among us have chosen to reject God, to hold on to self, and to hope to negotiate religiously for what happens after this. Peter calls us to be of sober mind and to recognize that we've got to have a, an urgency and a passion 
to share the gospel, to ask the hard questions, to live this life of faith, to let this test prove the genuineness of our faith and let that genuineness be a shining beacon of hope and light to our family members, our neighbors, our co workers. That's our call. That's the truth to be as Christians. And people just say, no, you've got to do it now. And he brings us to 419. I promise that there would be a simple conclusion to this, and here it is. In 419, he says this, and I just love it. He says, that those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. He concludes this whole thing with, with these two realities. First, he says, entrust your soul to a faithful creator. This word is two and then the second word is uh, mind, but, it, but it means to place alongside. It is actually used in, in the banking trade to talk about a deposit. How does a deposit work when you put a deposit in the bank? Is the bank just doing that out of the graciousness of their heart? No, what the bank does is they take a me- measly little uh, um, deposit that I put in there, right? So let's take that couple hundred bucks that I put in that bank, and they will put that alongside other money that's put in that bank, and then they invest it. This is the word that, that Peter chooses to use here. He pulls it out of that banking world to bring it into this narrative of Christianity to say that we are to entrust our souls to the faithful Creator. We're to take our souls and put it alongside our faithful Creator. This speaks a lot of I love the Lord your God by your heart. So, no, strange. Sounds a lot like you've been reconciled to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. We our soul. Yes, we need to do that initially, but we also, Christians, we also have to do that daily. Daily. Think about that daily. Reconcile your books daily. You wake up in the morning, take your soul, and you can either just go out there yourself and try to make whatever returns you can, but what if you could take that little bit of the soul and lay it alongside God's soul and now make the investment? This is the picture that Peter paints for us. This is the picture we're not alone. We have each other. We're not alone. This is God's story. We're not alone. Jesus has walked this path. We're not alone. The Holy Spirit has come as our help. But we have the responsibility to take our soul and lay it alongside God's. David, I said, this is how I'm going to live this life. And then he says, while you're doing good. While you're doing good. You can look at a lot of places in Scripture, but I think what brings it to a head and a clear understanding, we've talked about it in Micah 6 says, He's told you, O man, what is good. You have to do with quality, but to do justice. And to and to walk humbly with your God. It sounds a whole lot like It sounds a whole lot like the ministers of reconciliation. Peter takes us through with all of the scriptures. If you have got to yourself, you stop this negotiating with God for what self can do in the afterlife, but you have died to yourself and taken on that new life in Christ. God says, You are my baby. Peter says, Beloved, you're going to go through tests and you're going to go through trials. But it's good. It's so the genuineness of your faith can be proven and that your witness can be expanded. And so rejoice that God would take you through that. And he says, if you understand that as the framework, here's what your day looks like. Good morning, Lord. I take my soul and I lay it down beside yours. And we're going to invest this together. And now I'm going to go do good. Lord, I love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and now I'm going to go love my neighbor as myself. Lord, I trust and embrace that I've been reconciled to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. And so now, let's go be ministers of reconciliation. This is what Peter calls us to. You are the Lord. Trust your soul to God. Do justice, love, kindness, and walk humbly with Him. And we can embrace whatever comes at us together and rejoice, knowing there's a finish line, and we're going to get there together. Peter says that's what it means to be a Christian. Well, let's go do that. Let me pray.
many times I failed to invest my soul in you. To take my meager little, little dog that bank and puts it right next to all that you are. And Lord, forgive me for that. But I thank you that no matter how many tests I face along those lines, you remain faithful. And here we are again, and here we have another test. Lord, may we be found faithful in you. Lord, your church is hurt. Yeah, in this valley, yeah, in this nation, but around the world, your church is hurting. Yeah, there's some pleasure in absolutely. There's growth. You can measure that better than we can do. There's a lot of hate for me. Lord, I pray for those who have closed off their heart to each other. Who turn for bitterness, anger, and frustration, and fear, and then hatred. Lord, for those of us who take up that big caucus daily and just walk around with self hanging around our neck. Lord, the church is not not done. I pray you would take us by the hand. Send your Holy Spirit to help us. Oh, Lord, we need it. But take us through this fire trial. Thank you, Lord. Our witness to those around us. That you are 